Amen. Do please take a seat and let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the gospel of John. Thank you that these things were written, that we might believe in Jesus, and that by believing we might have life in his name. Help us then to clearly see Jesus and to respond to him appropriately, and to bow down before him as the king of all kings. Be with us now and help us as we open the scriptures. For Jesus' sake, amen. In this scene, there is one man who is in fact God, and he is truly all-powerful. He can do anything he wants, and yet he appears weak, helpless, defenseless. There is another man who presents himself as being powerful, but he is in fact backed into a corner and forced to act in a way that he does not really want to. The reality is a complete reversal of the appearance. How it appears on the surface is not at all how it really is. And we'll see that as we work our way through this passage. Chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now that would be a shocking verse in and of itself. But just cast your eye back to verse 38 of the previous chapter, and you'll see that Pilate has already declared Jesus to be innocent. He says, I find no basis for a charge against him. The man is innocent, Pilate says. Surely the next thing you would expect him to say is, Jesus is released. (laughs) The case is thrown out for a lack of evidence. There is no basis for a charge against this Jesus, and Pilate knows it. Luke's gospel gives us a longer speech from Pilate here, which is insightful. This is what Pilate said. You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing deserving of death. So a clear, unequivocal pronouncement of innocence. And then the very next verse, therefore I will punish him (laughs) and then have him released. What a strange sentence to find after a declaration of innocence. Clearly, he's not operating out of principle. He's pandering to the crowd, isn't he? He's doing what they want him to do, even though he knows it is not right. A courageous leader would have said, look, I've heard the case against him. I have interrogated him. I have found him innocent. I've sent him off to Herod. He has found no wrong in him either. He sent him back to me. I've talked to him again. I've given my verdict. He's done nothing wrong. He walks. He goes free. Not a hair on his head will be harmed because he is an innocent man I know it and you know it. But Pilate, of course, he knows he cannot afford to upset the religious leaders. These religious leaders, while they're not all powerful in Israel, they do have an enormous influence over the people. He knows that if he upsets them at a time like this, things will go very sour very soon for him. Why is the timing significant? Well, because it's Passover weekend of all the times of the year. It's Passover. There are about two million Jews gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This is a religiously supercharged crowd of fervent followers of God. Almost all of them respect the religious leaders. And so if you upset the religious leaders, you upset two million Jews at a time when things are balanced on a knife edge as it is. Passover is the time of year when they remember that they were once ruled over by an evil, oppressive superpower. They were living under Egyptian rule, weren't they? And of course, uh, God overthrew that empire and allowed them to walk out free from under their clutches. There is already a kind of sentiment of revolution in the air, isn't there? So why does Pilate have him flogged if he knows he is innocent? Well, the answer is this. He's trying to appease the crowd. He's trying to prevent an uprising. He's trying to be tactical here. He intends to inflict so much damage on Jesus and then present Jesus to the crowds that their kind of bloodlust will be satisfied. 
that they'll see what a mess they have made of Jesus. They will see with horror in their eyes and say, you know what? No one should have to endure this. Not even Jesus, who we've just been calling for the crucifixion of. It's okay, Pilate. We're not pursuing the death penalty anymore. Pilate has two great longings in the text. I want you to follow these as it unravels. He wants to please the crowd and set Jesus free. You might not know it, but that is truly what he wants. He wants both of those things, to please the crowd and to set Jesus free. And he's trying to have both of those things, though he can only have one. This, by the way, is his second attempt to do both of those things, satisfy the crowd and set Jesus free. The first attempt was just hinted at at the end of chapter 18. It's expanded upon in other Gospels. His first attempt was through the Barabbas plan. You remember this? He's a very clever guy, Pilate. He's got tricks up his sleeve. It's summarized in just two verses in John's Gospel. From chapter 18, verse 39, Pilate says, It is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. And then we're told, now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Barabbas is a genuinely vile and violent man. He is a real threat to the peace of Israel. Someone who genuinely might bring the wrath of Rome down upon them all in a way that Jesus clearly has never threatened to do. Again, Luke expands on Barabbas. He tells us he was thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. These are really serious crimes that Barabbas is locked up for. What is Pilate doing, even presenting a chance for this man to walk free? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's trying to have both of those things, satisfy the crowd and have Jesus released. And here's how he goes about it. He has the two men stand side by side, hoping that the crowd will see here is one full of love and compassion. Here is someone who's only ever healed the sick and fed the hungry and told the truth about the kingdom of God. He's told us that we can have hope in heaven if we turn from our sins and put our trust in Jesus. There is this Jesus standing here full of love. And there is a genuine menace. A convicted murderer who is provoking Rome to destroy us all. And we have to choose which one we want released? (laughs) Well, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Surely, Pilate thinks, surely they'll all pick Jesus. And then I get my way. I've satisfied the crowd and I've released Jesus. What a brilliant plan. But it all goes horribly and inexplicably wrong for him. Verse 40, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Can you believe they would call for his release over Jesus? And so he's forced to be as good as his word and release Barabbas to them. But he's still got this big problem on his hands of Jesus. It's fascinating getting the complete perspective from all the gospel writers. Because at this point, Matthew's gospel tells us that Pilate's wife had a dream, a supernatural dream, the sort of thing we were talking about this morning. The type of dream that we were talking about this morning that, that caused deep distress in her. She was aware that this was a supernatural occurrence. And so she sends a message to Pilate, her husband, in the middle of this trial. She says to him, don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Now, can you imagine how trapped Pilate is suddenly feeling by all of this? His conscience is telling him, let Jesus go. And the evidence is telling him, let Jesus go. And his wife is telling him, let Jesus go. But he can't do it for fear of upsetting the crowd. Ironically, he presents himself as being this kind of powerful figure in the narrative. He is anything but powerful. He's trapped, isn't he? He doesn't have the power even to do what he knows he should do. That's how powerless, how weak, how foolish, how selfish, really, a pilot truly is. So plan one failed, the Barabbas plan was a failure. Plan two, as we've just mentioned, is to cause Jesus to be so battered that when they see him, their heartstrings will be tugged. They will see Jesus in such an utterly sorry, blood-soaked state, evidently battered and bruised, that the crowd will say, that's enough. He's been through enough. 
Certainly he's upset some religious leaders and so on. But certainly he's trod on some toes in these last few years of glorious ministry. But nobody deserves this. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. What does it mean to have someone flogged? Well, literally whipped. In this era, the whip would be consisting of long leather lashes. And on the end of these lashes would be bits of metal and bone. It was specifically designed to dig into the flesh on the back and tear. Again, agony the likes of which we couldn't even imagine. Now, these are just the facts of it. You'll notice that John does not elaborate on the description. He doesn't need to for his audience. They know what it's like. But notice that he's not trying to stir up our emotions. He's just giving us the facts. But what kind of people would we be if we weren't at all stirred emotionally by this reality that Jesus endured this for our sake. This is shocking. It is stunning. Both the love of Jesus to voluntarily go through this and the hatred of mankind towards their maker. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. This crown, as I'm sure you know, would not just have irritated Jesus, not the kind of garden thorns that you see walking home. It would have pierced Jesus. It would have caused extraordinary amount of blood flow. These thorns were long and perfectly capable of puncturing skin. What would be the effect of a whole crown full of these thorns plunged into the scalp? There is a significant network of blood vessels in your head, which is why a small head cut can elicit a great deal of blood. At this point, Jesus' face would have been just a mask of his own blood, covered from his own wounds that the crown of thorns would have opened up on his head. And still they don't stop. They went up to him, listen to this, again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Do you get the sense that they're enjoying this? This is not required of the soldiers to mock Jesus. They've clothed him in purple. They've put a crown upon him. Matthew's gospel says that they blindfolded him, put a staff in his hand as though it were a a scepter for a king. They smacked him around the face and said, prophesy, which one of us hit you? As we read here, they slapped him in the face. They also spat upon him multiple times and tore his beard from his face. Again, none of that was required of them. It's purely an expression of their hatred towards Jesus. Look at verse four. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Imagine that, bringing out this man, declaring him to be innocent and also that you have battered him to pieces. It's such hypocrisy, right? Such cowardice from him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to him, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Can you sense something of his desperation here? Something of his panic? He's feeling trapped. It's not going the way he expected it to. Things are only going to get worse for Pilate. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now, this seems to be new information to Pilate. Do you remember the charge that was formally brought against Jesus? It had to be a charge that the Romans would care about to get him killed upon a cross. And so they brought him up on the charge of treason, effectively, that he claimed to be a king, that he was inciting a rebellion. Which is why we saw last week Pilate asking those questions. Are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Well, now the Jews have let some more information slip. Who knows if they intended to reveal this or not. But certainly in the heat of the moment, they've revealed their true motive. They're trying to kill him actually on the charge of blasphemy. It's because he claimed to be God. That's why they want him gone. My word, thinks Pilate. Did he really claim to be the son of God? Imagine the hair on the back of his neck standing up at the thought of that. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. Can you picture that scene? It plays out like a a film strip in my mind. I can see the, the fear in Pilate's eyes. I can hear the kind of tremble 
in his voice as he asks Jesus these questions. Where do you come from? Starting to suspect that this man might not be all that he appears. He might be much more than that. Jesus is clearly like no one he's ever met before. Pilate, no doubt, has presided over many deaths before. He has no doubt seen many people plead for their lives and beg to avoid the cross. And here is Jesus standing before him. He's silent. He's calm. He's confident. He's self-assured. Almost as though he's completely in control, even though he's on the receiving end of this horrible mistreatment. Pilate was amazed by him from the first interaction they had together. Now he finds out that this man, Jesus, has claimed to be the very son of God. You could almost feel sorry for Pilate if he weren't such a coward. He's trapped, ultimately, by his own sinful pride. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Now, isn't it remarkable? just how unaware Pilate is of the true dynamics of this situation. Firstly, he is a mere mortal, isn't he? The most powerful person on the planet could not boast about his power to the very son of God. He's there talking with Jesus. Jesus, who walked on water, who raised people from the dead, who fed thousands of people with miracle bread. God himself made flesh and walking among mere mortals. Imagine going up to that God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and boasting about your power to him. (laughs) It's like an ant boasting to a lion that it's pretty dangerous, don't you know? (laughs) Not at all, Pilate. You have no power, especially not compared with Jesus. He's so powerless in this situation, he doesn't even realize it. Now, technically, Pilate is in charge of the people, but do you see that pride is in charge of Pilate? He's a slave to his own sin. And he can't even see it to free himself from it. He knows with his head what is the truth. And yet his heart is in the grip of godlessness. There's nothing he can do about it. In reality, he has next to no power because he knows what he ought to do. And he can't bring himself to do it. It's like the definition of powerlessness. He is, in fact, the picture of a powerless man. And yet he still puffs up his chest and lifts up his chin and boasts to the very son of God. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate says. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus responds with silence. Don't you think that most people, having received this treatment, having been bruised and battered such as Jesus has been, don't you think they would at least be weeping by this point, at least be pleading, at least be begging to let the punishment stop here? Just don't send me to the cross. Not Jesus. (laughs) In fact, would you believe it? That's the one place he wants to go for the sake of his people. Completely self-assured, conducting himself even now with real dignity and true majesty. Jesus doesn't dignify Pilate's ignorance with an answer, just meets it with silence. And of course, in doing so, he's fulfilling prophecies from Isaiah 53, that like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus speaks only when he chooses to, and not when someone else demands him to. He goes on to say, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. I think there's a great double meaning in it, knowing Pilate's own personal circumstances. Firstly, all power, all position comes from God in the first place. It's a gift from him, and we will be judged for how we have used these kinds of gifts while on earth. Were we selfish or selfless? with the position, with the power that we were given. Also, as we talked about last week, Pilate's position is largely there because he's married into the right family. He's married into the family of the emperor. It was a position given to him from above, as it were. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Jesus continues, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. Notice they're both guilty of sin. There's no getting around that. Both Pilate and those who handed Jesus over to Pilate, the religious authorities, Judas and the like, who handed Jesus over, they claimed to be waiting for the Messiah. They claimed to be longing for the Messiah. And when the Messiah turned up, all they tried to do was kill him. They are guilty of the greater sin, trying to slay the very son of God. But don't miss that statement. You are both guilty of sin, Jesus says. 
They are guilty of the greater sin, but nevertheless, Pilate, you are guilty of sin. You will know that Pilate eventually loses this kind of back and forth with the crowd, and he washes his hands of the situation. You remember that? He declares himself innocent of this man's blood. What an extraordinarily arrogant thing for Pilate to do. Just because you declare yourself innocent doesn't make you innocent, does it? Just because you wash your hands does not mean that you can wash your heart of the sin that saturates your being. It's not nearly as simple as that. It took the death of Jesus to deal with sins. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's the answer. And so Jesus declares him guilty of a very serious set of sins. As we saw this morning, all sin deserves death. If we are not cleansed by Jesus, if he does not die in our place, then the punishment lands upon us. It has to. Pilate might declare himself innocent, but that won't save him. Pilate might wash his hands and call himself clean, but that won't save him. What he needs is for this lamb to be a substitute in his place to deal with his sins once and for all. It's the only way he will ever get to be regarded as innocent. Now, we don't know if Pilate ever did repent. We can certainly say this much. There is no indication in the text that he did. It seems as though this stark statement of truth from Jesus that he is guilty of a very serious sin, it does fire him up and get him into action. He believes Jesus is innocent of crime. He might even be innocent of sin. He claims to be the very son of God and certainly displays a kind of supernatural confidence, even in the face of the worst death the world has ever seen. And so as a result of this exchange between him and Jesus, we read verse 12, from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. Did you hear that? He tried to set Jesus free. But as you know, he didn't set Jesus free. So despite his great claims of personal power, he does not even have the power to set an innocent man free even when he wants to. That's how powerless he really is in this situation. His sin rules over him, of course. Well, the religious leaders, they have one last card to play. And they know this will seal the deal. This is where they begin to shout, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Now, we've already seen that Jesus is a king, but of an otherworldly kingdom. At any hint of his disciples wielding weapons, he has told them to stop. We've also seen that the real reason he's on trial in the first place is not because of his claim to be king, but actually his claim to be Messiah. That's why the Jewish leaders hate him and want rid of him. That's why their minds have been made up to have him killed. So neither of those objections is actually true. But still, this is the threat that strikes fear into Pilate's heart. If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. As we've already said, Pilate seems to have obtained this position through marriage rather than through merit. He's already on precarious ground. It also happens to be the case that if Tiberius Caesar, the emperor at the time, suspected someone, even a family member of being disloyal, he would kill them off like that. He killed a son and a grandson and a nephew and many others beside, but close family members included. Certainly he'll have Pilate killed without a second thought if he thinks Pilate is disloyal. He was absolutely merciless. If that rumor finds its way back to Caesar, he'll be in real serious trouble. It is the thing that pushes him over the edge. So verse 13, and notice how it's directly connected with what the religious leaders said. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. We talk about treachery, right? There it is. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. As we close, I want you to picture that scene. Pilate, as we've noted, literally sat in the judgment seat with Jesus standing before him. Do you see how that scene is a direct reversal of what will happen at the end of time? 
There's Pilate, a pretender, a poser with no real power. He plops himself on the judgment seat as though he has any authority at all, but he doesn't. Not really. The whole thing is a sham. His decisions were made for him by his own pride, by his own sin, by his own ruthless desire for self-preservation. And so he apparently casts judgment down upon Jesus. At the end of time, the roles will be exactly reversed. And Jesus Christ will sit in the judgment seat with all power and might and majesty and authority. And he will one day look at this man, Pilate, and will say, you called yourself clean, but you never cleansed yourself in the blood of the lamb. You never let me wash away your sin. Your pride literally caused you to push me away. You declared yourself innocent, but I have called you guilty. Away from me, all you evildoers, for I never knew you. And he will consign him to the eternal darkness where the worm does not die and the fire does not burn out. Pilate thinks he has power, but he does not know, he does not see that as he casts his judgment upon Jesus, he is truly just bringing judgment down upon himself. The same is true of you, by the way, and the same is true of me. Down here on earth, you have a few short years to make up your mind about Jesus. You have a few short years to, as it were, arrive at your judgment about him. And what you declare about him is what will be declared about you one day. If you say, away from me, Jesus, then one day when the roles are reversed and he sits in the judgment seat and you stand before him, he will say that to you. Away from me. I never knew you. If you reject him now, you will be rejected by him for all eternity. That is a prospect that ought to terrify you. But Jesus came on a rescue mission to seek and save the lost. If you have the humility to accept Jesus now, you will be accepted by Jesus then. If you call him your friend now, you will be called friend by him then. If you want relationship with him now, you will have relationship with him for all eternity. So my final plea for you today, if you trust Jesus, then rejoice and relax. The work has been done for you by him. You have much to give thanks for. If you do not trust Jesus, may it be the case that you get no rest, no peace in your heart, no sense of eternal safety until the day you bow your heart before him and say, Jesus, I love you. And I want relationship with you. And on that day, you will be delighted to find that he says exactly the same about you. I love you and I want relationship with you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Thank you that he had such power and yet was willing to lay it aside temporarily. To humble himself and become a man, even to die and to die upon a cross. As we see him in the scriptures here, it stirs our hearts to see the courage with which he went through these final hours of his earthly life. Will you help us, Lord, to be not just moved, but changed? Will you help us not to just regret our bad decisions like Pilate, but to repent of them, to turn from them, and to put our trust in you? And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.